Hello, dear friends. Today we will take a look at the memoirs written by non-commissioned officer Henrik Nova. He was a machine gunner who was taking a position along with eight other soldiers in the fortified point called WN-72. June 6, 1944 marked the first day of the Normandy landings by the Allies, the D-Day. The most dramatic events took place on the Omaha Beach. The American attack was launched against the enemy's well-prepared defensive lines. The German positions were barely affected by the air and naval bombardment that preceded the landing operation, resulted in severe losses, and forever remembered in the military annals of history. The Omaha Beach was six miles in length and was divided into eight sectors, Charlie, Dog Green, Dog White, Dog Red, Easy Green, Easy Red, Fox Green, and Fox Red. The first wave had a company of soldiers for each sector. The Allied High Command anticipated that Omaha would be the most problematic for the landing. A labyrinth of all kinds of obstacles, such as anti-tank barriers, obstacles, and mines, lay ahead for men and vehicles in the shallows and on the beaches. Over breakwaters approximately 5 feet high, located at the foot of a breaking wave ledge of up to 100 feet high, there were wire fences. The ledge was dotted with mines. There were 85 machine gun positions above it and on it, all ready to greet the infantrymen with killing fire. Well, now we will look at the memoirs of a German machine gunner. The air bombardment caused us no serious problems, but the bombardment from the sea destroyed the machine gun positions located a few hundred meters from the WN-72, and was quite shocking for me and my comrades. One of us, mentally broken, jumped out of the entrenchment and died, cut down by shrapnel. The terrifying thundering ceased, and as you might expect, it brought us great relief. There was ringing in my ears. There was blood on my face, which got into my eyes. We realized the halt of the shelling meant that the landing would begin any moment now. So we rinsed our eyes with water from our flasks. We pushed aside the metal sheets that covered our trenches and stood slowly to our feet, and one after another poked our heads out over the concrete barrier. I placed my MG-42 in the loophole and recalled how my father had told me numerous times that he had been forced to do so when he used to be a machine gunner in the Battle of the Somme during the World War I. Now the same thing was done by me. While we were in shelter, the landing vessels and boats approached pretty close to the coast. I had no idea yet who the nationalities of the men sitting in those boats were. There were a lot of boats. About a dozen of them were approaching me, cutting through the waves. They seemed to be about one kilometer from our position but we could see along the whole stretch of beach that there were many more of them, and they were coming up. Behind them, we saw some small warships of all types. The sea was totally swamped by this huge flock. You may be curious as to what I was thinking when I saw them approaching us. Frankly, I do not recall any clear thoughts or feelings in my mind, except my worry about whether my machine gun had been damaged by the shelling. I fired a second long burst to test it. The guys in the second machine gun crew gave me a yell to hold the fire and follow orders. I shouted back for them to test their machine guns, what they did. Then I heard incidental brief bursts all over the cliff. The survivors of the bombardment were testing their weapons. Our heavy artillery guns opened fire. They were 88mm guns positioned in casemates to the side of us. We had three such guns in our section, but only two of them were firing, and I concluded that one was destroyed. The crews of these guns were very accurate in firing and hit the bow section of one of the landing boats. It was a high explosive projectile. It went through and detonated inside the boat. I saw that one of the boats nearing my position had been struck in the same way. Its ramp flew up into the air, and I saw many men inside it who had been wounded, but there were others who had not been affected. They began their efforts to climb up the sides of the boat because it had begun to lean forwards. Its bow was flooded with water. Now I was able to conclude they were Americans judging by their helmets. The artillery threw another shell into the crowd, causing several men to be knocked out of the boat into the water. It started to sink with the bow forward, the stern raised into the air, and the men instantly fell into the sea. These scenes continued all along the beach as shells hit these boats, and on some occasions they simply caught on fire. At this moment the vessels opened fire on the beach to overwhelm our gunnery, and they achieved the required result. We kept our heads down again, and our 88mm guns stopped firing. But I still kept observing through my loophole and found that notwithstanding the losses, the landing boats had begun to lower the ramps and the men who were inside them had begun to step out of them and get into the water. They weren't rushing. It was all happening in an orderly, very organized manner. 
The boats were stopping where the water reached people's chest or neck. In most cases, the men were struggling to move forward one by one, holding on to the knapsack of the man ahead of them. Everything looked as if they were in combat training or on a drill. When the last man entered the water, the boat would reverse, close the ramp, and other boats would approach the beach alongside. The discipline and skill of the soldiers, the way the boats were operated, was spectacular. So the first lines of these guys wandered toward me. That's the only word suitable for the situation. They moved in a slow and orderly manner. They were already out to where the water was shallower. The waves were up to their chests or waists now. It was just at that moment that we opened fire, as ordered. They were about 400 meters away from us. At first, I did not aim individually at anyone, but led the barrel of the machine gun from left to right along the beach. This way, I had several men cut down in each line. You must remember that the MG-42 was a weapon of such powerful force that its bullets would frequently go through the human body and hit everything that was behind it. So a lot of these guys were killed by bullets that had gone through the body of a man or two who was ahead of him. After that, I began to aim more selectively in order to save ammo. I fired short bursts at small groups of men and hit them like that. The Americans tried to weather it all. Some of them tried to make it to the shore faster. They were still advancing pretty slowly, and because of this, at a short distance away from me, they seemed to be easy targets. On several occasions they tried to remain in the water where it was neck deep, probably in the hope that they would be less noticeable that way. I did not fire at them because I could not see them advancing. In other cases the men tried to shelter themselves behind anti-tank hedges or hollows, but they were far too narrow to provide a man with any defense and they got hit by our bullets. Other guys I saw were dropping their knapsacks and equipment and running out onto the sand, attempting to cross the beach and get to the breakwater. Of course, I gave them special attention and tried to ensure that none of them passed more than a few steps. A second machine gun of ours was operating the same way, and together we prevented the Americans from getting onto the beach in front of us. I also fired alongside the beach at those who made it out onto the sand. During this action, there were vessels occasionally firing at us, and there were boats behind the landing boats that were firing rockets over the dunes. The explosions of these rockets were grand, but they fell below the target. In the meantime, one of our 88mm guns opened fire again and sank a few more landing boats. The entire area of water opposite us was full of them, and the ones from which the soldiers had already landed collided with the boats that were on fire or drifting, damaged, and losing steering control. Frankly, I have no idea for sure how many people I killed. What I can say is that the shallow waters just in front of us were full of bodies, no fewer than 100 of them. This kind of number was typical of the entire beach in front of the other firing positions. The incoming tide was beginning to run, and these bodies were rolling over and bobbing on the waves and helmets and rifles and other equipment were hanging out in the water with them. I found myself feeling bad for these guys after the initial burst of energy and the determination I experienced as the attack began. They kept arriving in their boats. The boats were unloading them, and they were wandering toward us across the water all in the same manner as the previous wave of landing troops. We were still firing at them in the same way, killing them and mutilating them. My number two was not indifferent to this. He shook his head and said that it was not right for Americans to have their men sacrificed in this way. I have already said that my father was on the Somme during World War I. He used to tell me that on the Somme, the German machine gunners were yelling at the advancing British to get back and save their lives. There was no such communication between ours and the Americans here. In any case, I have not heard of it. We only stopped firing when the barrel of our MGs would start to overheat and cause misfires. We did not want our guns to fail, so we put them down and let them cool down. Then we would pick up our rifles and shoot with them. This would mean that our hands and heads would be above the barrier, and it was only at this point that I noticed the first bullets flying at us. There were some bumps in the beach caused by the shelling, and there were some environmental bumps, such as the low sand and gravel beneath the breakwater ledge. Some of the Americans sheltered in or behind these bumps and fired at us on sporadic basis. At this stage, the vessels stopped firing. I guess they were observing and expecting that a close battle was about to break out. But the Americans sheltering behind the gravel berm were unable to advance because we opened fire on them whenever they came up from behind it. In the meantime, the tide was running at full force, so that the sand had less and less space. This meant that the soldiers arriving on the beach had almost no space at all to seek cover so the carnage restarted. That is all for today. If you enjoyed the video, please like it and support the channel by subscribing. Goodbye to everyone, and we'll wait for the next time.